The year 2007 saw a critical issue brought to the forefront. Suddenly, parents found themselves worrying about the toys their children played with, and the words lead paint became an all too familiar topic. But the problem was neither new, nor did it originate in a toy store. While there are certainly other sources of lead in a child's environment, U.S. health officials say most kids get it from exposure to lead-based paint and lead-contaminated dust in older homes and deteriorating buildings. In 2003, when the program began, we were sixth in the nation for the number of childhood lead poisoning cases. And at that time, uh, in population, we were probably ranked 51 or 52 in the country. Janine Aragui serves as program director of Lead Safe St. Louis and has worked diligently on the program since Mayor Francis Slay first launched the initiative and formed his task force. Using city employees, community partnerships, grants, and data in new and more efficient ways, we are well on our way to comprehensive primary prevention of lead poisoning in the city of St. Louis. It became a collaborative effort because the comprehensive action plan actually wrote in a program to team up the city's agencies so that we were working together uh, with a common approach. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, one in 80 children in America have high levels of lead in their blood. Although great strides have been made in the last two decades, too many children are still at risk. A child can be treated to reduce their blood lead levels but the damage that's occurred is already there. And so it's extremely important to get rid of these hazards in housing and in candy and toys where kids could be exposed. Matt Steiner is an epidemiologist for the health department and works closely with Janine. Through data and research, he can study and pinpoint the problem spots in the city. And I found that back in 2001, there were only three wards in the city that did not have screening prevalence rates above nine. And so I looked at all of the maps for the wards for each of those years. And as you continue to progress throughout the years from 2001 to 2007, you see the maps get lighter and lighter as the rates of lead poisoning has declined so much. What we try to do is take a evidence-based approach to this. And so we go into the areas of the city that historically have the highest rates. And so as you can see, the way to think about these three charts is the top one represents where the lead poisoning is. The middle chart represents where the expenditures have been. And the bottom one represents where we're seeing the most impacts in terms of the reduction of childhood lead poisoning in the city of St. Louis. Jerry Wessels heads up the building division's lead inspection and hazard control section for the city and deserves credit for the department's hard work. The building division section carries the brunt of the inspections and the remediations, but we have a lot of partners at the health department uh, and outside the city who, who further our efforts. Jerry took us on a project site where the in-house crews were working to show us what they had found. The lead paint would be found uh, virtually on any painted surface in the building. We would almost always find it on the outside, on the windows and the doors, and any wood trim on the outside. Uh, but it could be on walls and woodwork throughout the inside. The backyard has very little grass, and all the spots we could in the backyard have high levels of lead. So that would be another area we're going to remediate. If a home requires extensive remediation, relocating of the family may be necessary. We do have a program where we can relocate people to a new apartment or a new home. Uh, we relocate people temporarily, as we will in this case, while the windows are being replaced, or again, we can uh, relocate them permanently if we just can't clean up the situation. We also experienced a first-time assessment with lead abatement inspector Terrell Nickelberry. Well, good morning. Hi. I'm Inspector Nickelberry. I'm here to do the lead inspection. Oh, thanks how so you much. Doing when we walk into a home, we want to establish how much lead dust they may have in their home. So what we do is we'll take a dust sample, and that's what we call a uh, lead wipe, a sample of dust off a windowsill and a floor of each room in that house. These are transported to a lab that we use, and they will analyze 
the amount of dust found on each one of those wipes. Inspectors use a state-of-the-art XRF lead paint analyzer to determine how high the lead concentration really is. 40.6, and that is way too high. We even have our own crew called the detox crew will come in and clean the windows, floors, or whatever needs to be done until we can get that person through the process of getting help from CDA. Daniel Berg is an assistant professor at Washington University School of Medicine and has organized a group on environmental issues. He has been more than willing to help. I think of lead poisoning um, as important because it's a metaphor for how our society values children and especially children who live in poverty. Lead poisoning causes mental deficits in children who are affected, uh, at least at lower IQ and also it can cause some behavioral problems. Everyone involved seems extremely dedicated to the program. I'm passionate about this program because if a child is lead poisoned, it presents a lifelong challenge with health, education, behavior, and so every child who has those issues is a problem for our community. Dr. James Kimmy shares that passion. Dr. Kimmy is executive director of the Missouri Foundation for Health, and they granted us almost one and a half million dollars a couple of years ago to increase our outreach programs in the city. We're probably the lead paint capital of the, of the United States, and so a program that has uh, real potential for changing that, for attacking it at the root, where their lead is, uh, seemed to us a very good investment. And that investment includes everything from funding the media campaign to funding a program of citizen advocates comprised of public health nurses and social workers. I think it's very important that there not be a barrier, a financial barrier to getting this done. Uh, there are a lot of financial barriers in healthcare, but I don't think we can afford to have financial barriers on this one. One of the major concerns has been the lack of public awareness. Landlords, property owners, um, do-it-yourself homeowners all need to be aware that when they do work around a house, they can create lead hazards if they don't do the work in a lead-safe manner. Jessica Perez and her family found this out the hard way when they purchased a home in 2004 and had it rehabbed. When we hired the contractor, we didn't realize that um, the contractor was not um, aware of lead-safe practices, apparently. Jessica, like a lot of people, had a misconception about some of the causes of lead poisoning. The first year we were fine, so we thought we were good. The second year we, were, we thought we were fine, and we got the test back and it was a 10, which was a huge trauma for us. We had no idea that it was coming, and it was, it was really upsetting. The last thing Jessica and her husband were expecting was for their two-year-old daughter, Eva, to become ill. We had friends that were doing rehabs and living in the house and you know we were thinking they would have problems but since we waited to move into the house until after the rehab we, we were shocked that she actually had a problem. Thankfully through Lead Safe St. Louis they were able to get the help they needed. They came through and they painted all of the woodwork that had the lead paint in it, especially anything that had nicks. And then they went outside and they painted all of the, um, the porch where she plays and the woodwork out there. And then they replaced all of the windows. And today, little Eva is fine. She is about to turn four old and she um, is doing great. Everything's fine um, and also her lead level is down to five. Rebecca Qualls is a landlord who lives in a converted one family attached to a four family. She found herself in a similar situation. I had a tenant who had a child with elevated lead levels. And about six months after that, my son turned five months and I decided to get his lead levels checked and they were elevated also. And so I became really concerned that the building was causing the lead elevation. The Qualls did have a problem, eventually deciding to remediate their home and the Four family as well. After we had moved out, it fell. It fell all the way down to zero. They couldn't detect lead in his blood. 
and then I moved back in before they did the remediation and once again it jumped up like to a five. Eventually the family qualified for the 50-50 landlord program offered by the city. Their place was fixed for free and for the adjoining four family they paid half. They did um, a long list of things for us. The most important I think was replacing all the windows and the doors which was huge. We had over 65 windows in the combined building and 12 doors. Without the city's help, Rebecca says the task would have been daunting. To have someone come in and tell you what needs to be done, to hire the people to do it, to set all that up for you, it really is a relief. I can go to bed. My son is doing wonderful. He really is. His lead levels have dropped. The last time we had him tested, he was under a five. So I'm really glad and happy. And the one-year-old was just tested and he's normal. Doesn't look so. like it fits. Renita Hightower is an example of a landlord that took a proactive stance. I have heard about the lead problem in our city, especially in our older homes. And because I wanted to start my business in my home, I was concerned about that. At the time I participated in a lead program, I had nine children. And they were from newborn to four years old. So they were definitely at an early age of development and that we were definitely concerned about their lead exposure. There we go, now here you now. Yes. Yes, <laughs> the remediated program has really changed my attitude towards lead safety. When explaining to some of the parents, I know more about it. I know what they're going to do and what they're not going to do and the safety of it. Another challenge for the Lead Safe program has been in getting the medical community to commit to state required testing for kids ages one through six. Many physicians in the city test children at ages 12 months and 24 months because it's required by Medicaid. But if they don't see any detectable lead levels, they don't continue to test at ages three, four, five, and six. We found that 30% of children who had an undetectably low level at age one later on had a level of greater than five. 30% of them did. In St. Louis Public Schools, I think the data is um, about 30% of the kids move each year. So physicians may not be attuned to that. The schools, however, have been making an effort to educate teachers, children, and parents alike. And we're with Lead Safe St. Louis. And this morning, we're here to do a very special puppet show for you today. Was that mean old trickster who? Mr. On this day at Baden Elementary, the kids are learning about lead safety with a puppet show. This is the way we swallow my toys to chase away Mr. Lead's fly. It was reading the book. They are also getting their blood tested. The CDC has th set the threshold for lead poisoning at 10 micrograms per deciliter. And that is measured with the finger stick and the blood. If you have 5 micrograms per deciliter in your blood, you are not deemed lead poisoned. But there is some evidence of exposure there that could be a cause for concern. If a child is at the point of treatment, then we've really missed the point because the point is preventing exposure. Although there's still work to be done, Janine says she is pleased with the program's progress. In 2003, there were a, a little over 400 lead inspections performed in the city of St. Louis by city programs. And in 2007, over 1,000 lead inspections were performed. The number of kids who had lead poisoning was over 1,600, and this year it was a, a little over 500. The focus needs to continue to be on primary prevention. We need to catch these, these houses and these kids before they become lead poisoned, and that's what the city's model is. I have to credit the mayor for making lead poisoning prevention a priority and putting resources into this and working to create a program that is effective. And I think that kind of leadership is absolutely essential to getting this kind of program. And please welcome the mayor for a State of the City address. At the recent State of the City address, Mayor Slay spoke with pride about how far the program has come since 2003. At that time, the rate of lead poison children was 13.6% of the tested children under age six. 
Today, through the collaborative work of the Health Department, the Building Division, and our community partners that make up the Lead Safe St. Louis Task Force, the rate has fallen to 4%, a reduction of more than 65%. Those are real children that are being saved. I think we've come a long way, but I think we have a lot of work to do. If the resources are there, the solution is there. And it really is going to take the public continuing to be informed, to get exercised about it, and uh, to put the resources into it. And yeah, this can be solved. I know that lead poisoning robs children of their talents, their health, their education, their, their behavior skills. And if we're able to prevent more children from having those challenges in life, then the whole community becomes a stronger place to, to live and play and grow. For more information on Lead Safe St. Louis, you can call 314-259-3455 or go to www.leadsafestlouis.org.